Human rights groups have welcomed the High Court's ruling on sending asylum seekers to Malaysia. Human rights lawyer Julian Burnside QC joins us now in the studio. Welcome. Good yeah, morning. Now, a question I need to ask you is the Minister was so emphatic in his confidence a few weeks ago, saying, we didn't do this lightly, we had legal advice all the way through that this was legal. We believe we're on very strong, very solid ground. Where was that advice coming from? Well, I, I don't know. Um, all of these points are contestable once you get to the High Court. But the fact is, <clears throat> Australia signed the Refugees Convention, uh, and by that we agree to protect people who seek asylum. And there's got to be limits to how carelessly you can treat them. I'm throwing them out to another country that isn't going to look after their human rights, or might just on a good day, if they feel like it, look after their human rights. That is not a way of discharging our obligations. The High Court pounced on that very issue. In fact, Chris Bowen argued that the High Court had set a new test when it comes to treating asylum seekers. Do you see this as an example of High Court adventurism? No, not at all. I think this is the High Court holding the government to account to um, adhere to the standards which Australia has voluntarily agreed to when it signed the convention decades ago. So in your reading of the judgment in the time since it was handed down yesterday, was there any new test applied or, or could it be that the minister just didn't understand it? Um, I, I suspect that the minister hadn't fully appreciated that the court might hold Australia to its obligations under the Refugees Convention. Uh, and, and I mean, I think it's a great thing that they did because, you know, Australia has, has undertaken a number of obligations under human rights conventions, international human rights conventions. And in recent years, we've been pretty careless about those obligations. We have thought, oh, well, we can tell the world we'll act well towards people, but we'll mistreat them uh, as we like. And frankly, I don't think Nauru is likely to be any better than Malaysia. Well, the because Minister was careful in saying that he wasn't mm. going to rule anything or in or out. Sure. What ramifications mm. would this have for a potential solution in Nauru? There is a real question whether Nauru has the uh, infrastructure and the domestic legislation to treat refugees properly. Last time around, it wasn't Nauru doing anything to asylum seekers. Australia colonised Nauru and was effectively running their organs of government in order to lock people up on Nauru. And the High Court pointed that out, essentially saying that if asylum seekers were sent to Nauru, that would happen again. They'd be processed, they'd be uh, looked after by Australian contractors. Hmm. So did you see that opening the door for the government to now look at Nauru? Um, I, I, I really wouldn't want to... I, I'd need to know exactly how they propose to approach it, hmm. but I do hope that the government does not think that they should either reintroduce te temporary protection visas or reintroduce the use of Nauru. You know, it's interesting. The Malaysian solution was supposed to be a solution to the problem of overcrowding in detention centres. The reason we have overcrowding in detention centres is that when people come here by boat rather than plane, we lock them up for as long as it takes to process their claim. That takes years. Now, um, if we did what we were telling Malaysia to do and release them initially after initial health and security checks, they'd be in the community and you would resolve the overcrowding immediately. The cost would fall from a billion dollars a year to much, much less than that and we would be back in step with Western civilised democracies in their treatment of people who are fleeing persecution. What do you think now should happen to those 335 asylum seekers the government was hoping to send to Malaysia? Should they be released into the, into the rest of the Christmas Island population? What, what, what should the government do with them? Of course, they should be treated like any other boat people. Their claims should be processed. Most of them are Hazaras from Afghanistan, mm. so it's a slam dunk that they're fair income refugees, and frankly, I think they should be processed quickly then released into the community with protection visas. With the High Court's ruling that sending asylum seekers to a, a third country like Malaysia is unlawful, mm. does that mean that the Howard era policy of uh, the Pacific solution could also have had a similar challenge mounted to it? Um, it's, it's difficult to know um, and it's probably not useful to speculate on it because it didn't happen and here we are in 2011. I, I really think both major parties need to step back and have a careful look at what we're doing and why we're doing it. Uh, you know, that we are still receiving very few asylum seekers by boat. 
You know, the, and the, the arrival rates now are less than half what they were this time last year. So where's the panic coming from? Mm. Politically, though, it just doesn't seem palatable for either party to do this. So do you think mm. you're butting your head against a wall here? <laughs> I'm, I'm sure I am. But I, I still think it's worthwhile. You know, the, the High Court has given us a gentle reminder mm. that there are some baseline standards of decency of treatment for people who come here asking for our help. And we have agreed with the international community that we will recognise certain you know, minimum requirements of decency. Now is the time to get serious about it. Look around, have a look at the rest of the Western democracies. None of them lock up boat people indefinitely. We're the only ones who do it. It costs us a small fortune to do it. Taxpayers are paying for that, all for the purpose of beating up on a small group of people, most of whom are genuine refugees. Now, the idea that we're going to be flooded with uh, boat people is one of the boogies that, that Chris uh, rather that um, Scott Morrison tries to bring out, but um, it's never happened in the past. Now, I don't see any reason why it'll happen in the future. It's a dangerous voyage. The other thing I'd say is this. They're now talking about temporary protection visas. Temporary protection visas were the direct cause of the CIVX disaster in October 2001, when 353 people drowned. The reason they were on that dangerous boat was they were mostly women and children trying to rejoin their husbands who were already refugees in Australia. But because they're on TPVs, they weren't allowed to come here for family reunion. So they did all that they could to get back with their families, get on a boat. And 353 people drowned that night because of temporary protection visas. Julian Burnside, we'll have to leave it there, but thank you for coming in this morning. Thank you. Thank you.